before this video starts, I just need to warn you, this is a very long video on the upwards of an hour. So if you have anything to do around the house, if any chores, any schoolwork, anything to do, or you just have time to waste, it's probably the video for you. Just put us in your earbuds, just sit back, relax, and enjoy. Get a snack and uh, enjoy this video because this is going to be an hour-long video, kind of like a podcast style of us just breaking down what we think the Bruins need to do uh, to make themselves a contender. Now, with that being said, enjoy the rest of this video. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Today, I am joined by Parker, aka On The Fly on YouTube. Go subscribe to him now. And uh, as you can tell, we're both in Bruins gear. He's got the whole Bruins gimmick in the background. Got the, the Bruins jerseys with, the, with Team Canada back there. Congrats on gold medal in the women's hockey, by the way. Yep, um, big, big win, big win. Uh, uh, you can also see my live reaction on my own channel. I did record my reaction to the game, so be sure to go check that out as well. Go check and it out. Also subscribe to Sam. Make sure to do that. Yes. Right. We're watching without being subscribed. Do it. Hit that button. Go. I was checking out it. my analytics the other day, and 70% um, of my viewers are not subscribed, so definitely do that for sure. I know. Crazy, right? Man. So today, Perfect. we are going to be breaking down what the Bruins need to do in order to make the playoffs this year or possibly even be a contender. We're recording this on Saturday, February 19th. And uh, this is before the Bruins game against Ottawa tonight. And um, if you missed it, Thursday night, I was live here on the channel for the Bruins and Islanders game. And after the game ended, I went on this 10 to 15 minute rant of on this team. And Parker reached out. He was like, hey, let's do a video together. So here we are. We're on Zoom. Let's get into this. So the Bruins now, uh, they are on a downward trend, but somehow are still in the playoffs. They're sitting at 27, 17, and 4 for 58 points in 48 games played. For the record, this was filmed Saturday afternoon before their game against Ottawa. Just so you know. And uh, the Bruins have dropped seven of their last 10. And they're going into a West Coast road trip starting late next week. Parker, what do we need to do to recover from this? Well, I think we need a lot of help. I'll, I'll start with that. Because as Fair of enough. right now, this team is struggling. They, they don't look like the quote-unquote Boston Bruins of years past. You look at teams, uh, even sort of like you look back, 20, 2010, 2011, that's that cup run. Uh, they were known for their sort of top two centers when you had sort of Krejci, Bergeron, uh, and they, they, those sort of been like a staple, right? You look at from 2010 to about 2019 when you've had those two guys going, they've been nothing but pretty much incredible, minus a few years in between uh, right. 2014, 15, of course. But um, aside from that year, really that team, those teams were really solid. And, and that's part of the issue with this year's team. And uh, we can see it every night, right? Where even if Bergeron's not there, as soon as either Marshawn or Bergeron aren't there, the team falls apart. And I mean, Halla and Nosek uh, have been sort of that second line-ish filler guys, uh, but they're not what like a Krejci level would have been, right? And I think that's sort of where one of Boston's biggest needs are. Um, and one player I think really could be a big benefactor uh, is a player like Claude Giroux. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have some thoughts. I know, I know that's one of the players you were uh, very interested in. So, okay, my thoughts on Claude Drew are, um, well, he's an amazing player, obviously. He just won All-Star MVP. He is one of, arguably, one of the best flyers of all time, in my personal opinion. However, he's a couple years younger than Bergeron. And on top of that, that contract, we simply cannot... Afford. I was looking into it the other day. I think he's making something like nine million a season, and he's a rental. I don't. Th I think his contract's up at the end of this year or next year. So, I don't think that would be a good investment. However, I will return with this. There is somebody um, who I posted on my Instagram story earlier today who I kind of thought maybe could have been a good interest, as the Canucks are interested in Jake Dubrask apparently. One per a couple people that I've thrown out. I said this on stream, Connor Garland could be something that we could look into 
or the biggest heavily rumored Canuck to be going out is JT Miller. Thoughts? JT, I like, I love JT Miller. The only issue with him is I think the Canucks, just like with all their guys, are going to overvalue, like, like just terribly overvalue their players. I even look sort of back to every other deadline. There's been every single time it's been either an overpayment toward like not for the Canucks, but the Canucks are getting the overpayment right? or they just don't do anything. Right. Like it's just the way they sort of believe in it. Even with the OEL deal, uh, everything well, they I was just going to mention that trade was awful. <laughs> yeah. That like, was, wow. It, it's sort of like the team that only trades if it's a guaranteed win. And, and I think that's going to be a real struggle for Boston to try and match unless they're going to throw some crazy package, which I hope they do. I mean, you look at the players on that team that could really help a team like Boston right now because they have the right D to do it. They have like OEL, you have all these guys uh, there to trade. You also have, of course, Garland and Miller, as you mentioned. Uh, and I think if they can put it together a big package deal. I mean, why not, right? I mean, right. you're not, this is probably, unfortunately, this probably is the last year or two more years before our core is gone with Marshawn and Bergeron. Uh, whether that's a trade out of Marshawn, obviously Marshawn still has four years, I believe, left on his contract. Um, yes. But at the end of the day, um, it, it's they're they're aging, right? They're they're not what they used to be. Marshawn is just getting better, although he is getting stupider. Um, that's another story for maybe another time. That is awful, but keep going. Love that. So fun to watch, which is so stupid. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so with that, Marshawn, and even look at sort of the core right now, you have the majority of the team, the average age is like 30, I think, give, give or take, might be 27, might be 28. Uh -huh. um, but at the end of the day, it, it, it's roughly around 30. So that means that we are an aging team, but unfortunately, we don't have the talent we used to. So it's not like a Tampa team where, although their, their average age is like 28, 29, everyone on Tampa is there for a reason. With Boston... Right. Uh, we have a lot of dead weight right now, especially with some of the older guys. Um, but like even the younger guys aren't what Tampa, like Tampa, for example, I always like bringing it back to Tampa because if Tampa were to go into a rebuild right now, they won't, but if they were, they'd be fine. They lose all their top players. They'd still be fine. Right. Because they have it just the, just the Eiserman plan works so well for them. And that's sort yep. of where they are as a team right now. One of the people who, uh, you mentioned last time we spoke back in like uh, last time you were on stream with me was in July. Um, you said it was probably the best contract the Bruins had um, they made um, was Nick Felino, who signed a, uh, a two year, $7.6 million contract. He's getting 3.8 this year, 3.8 next year. Would you like to um, rescind or retake back those comments you made back in uh, late July? Absolutely not. I think Nick Foligno is way better than Connor McDavid himself. Of course, I want to take back those comments. That was a, that was a terrible take. I mean, like, did the on paper it was a great move. Yeah. Just yeah, yeah. unfortunately, I don't know if it, if he's been hurt. He hasn't played like he's been hundred percent. I don't know if that's an injury. I don't know if that's sort of a slight thing that he's trying to play through. Because uh, he doesn't he doesn't look hundred percent. He does. He hasn't played hundred percent. I watched well, him pretty much every game with Toronto, and he looked ten times better than what he is putting out right now. Um, but I also don't know if that's the age thing, right? So, well, remember he was injured back in the majority of January with like this upper body injury, and I'll pull up his age right now. Felino is thirty-four, so he's yeah, he's getting up there too in sports terms. So, I don't know. Yeah, like it, it's one of those things, right? Because on paper, great move. You get a veteran guy who can still exactly. You you think in theory? Play, but, yeah. Yeah. You'd, you'd think in theory that Felino would be a good add to the team, but if anything, it's kind of bringing the team down. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I was watching the, I was watching the game against the Islanders, and I was confused because they had. F I, I think I mentioned this during the game. They had five left-handed shots on the ice at one point because they had Halla, DeBrusque, and Felino on the same line, which obviously was going to be a bad idea in the first place. And then they've got. Uh, a bag of bricks, Derek Forbert and Erho Vakanainen on the same, all on the ice, were all left-handed shots. And um, I was like, why do they have five left-handed shots in the ice? You know what I mean? Yeah. Whenever I see Derek Forbert, I do this. Pylon. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's all it is. Right now. Just 
He's sort of like Chara, just not with the leadership part. That's the way I've sort of seen him. Yep. He's been really struggling to skate. He plays for the most part alongside McAvoy, um, but that's that's, been, that's been <laughs> a mess. Um, but he's just he's been up and down, right? It's just, like they just haven't found it. They need someone to be that top two D um, alongside McAvoy because right now you can't put Grizzlick with them. Unfortunately, he doesn't play the same caliber McAvoy does, and every other defense there just isn't there, right? So. I mean, you could technically, I mean, I thought Mike Riley's been okay the past little bit and same with Erho Vakanainen. I think he's been okay. I mean, the, uh, the projected lines of the Bruins game tonight. Um, so apparently the, our prayers have been answered. Apparently Derek Forbert's going to be scratched tonight, but we also heard that Brandon Carlo got cut in morning skate with a writ with a skate blade to the wrist. So apparently we might be stuck with seeing Forbert with Mike Riley on the same D pair. Yeah. <laughs> Every time it just goes like this. Every time. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. It, it's Ugh. it's a tough team right now, especially when you start getting injuries. Because the idea of the off season was let's get as many C quality players as we can, right? Let, let's try and max out sort of that that top six role. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, now we're stuck with the top six role. Exactly. We have like six guys every night that are playing top six. Aside from maybe Macwa, who, in my opinion, Grizzlick isn't what he's projected to be, and that, that that's one of my controversial opinions. You might you might think differently, but from what I've seen, Grizzlick is not a top two defenseman uh, like the Bruins are playing him right now. You, I mean, you might think differently, but um, he's not the power he's this, play. I think he's the second best defenseman we've got. Absolutely, that, I agree. Completely. But I have to somewhat agree. Um, you also have to factor in the fact that he's five foot seven and he's a defenseman. Um, that is shooting yourself in the foot there with that one because Grizzly doesn't have the size that McAvoy does. McAvoy's six one, I think, and he also he plays a heavy game. He can he lays out guys. We've seen it before. He uh, in the Capitals game a few weeks ago he laid out um, somebody and it was a big big hit. You know, like he can you know, give a big hit, but Grizzly, I, he can't, he's like a little pipsqueak on the ice compared to all these big guys, you know? Well, that's just the thing, right? Matt Grizzly was Tory Krug's replacement. That, that's, that's yeah. how they envisioned him. I, 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 like, there's no way around it. That's what they thought he would be. Unfortunately, he wasn't. And that's, and that's sort of what we're stuck with now is trying to come out of the Krug era, which I mean, he wanted to go to a different team, whatever. That, that that was just a complete debacle. Uh, another sweet thing. Curious. I, I'll never forget. The, I remember exactly where I was too. Uh, as soon as I saw that, I'm like, just why? Because it was like a half million more from what the rumored contract was, and then, um, but whatever. I don't. I don't want to get into that because he's another one who they might actually bring back this year from St. Louis. And <laughs> I'd be that, down at this point. I'd be like, just help. Just like at this point, anybody's better than nobody, right? I mean, for me, I want to see one of two things. I want to see either them push for a playoff spot or I want to see them rebuild. I don't want to see them walk down the line blinded and just – it's like the Leafs, right? They keep getting knocked out in the first round. Um, but the difference between the Leafs and the Bruins right now is that the Leafs are actually good. And, the, the, like, they're just a younger, better team, right? Yep. So, um, at the end of the day, I mean, Boston has the potential – to rebuild right now and I think if they were to go into a heavy rebuild they might be good in say three four years but they have to take that into consideration and I don't think they will I think they're going to keep trying to push for this playoff spot um, but they, they should lock it up they should make a big deal right now I think right now is better than any time um, but it's also kind of depending on what other teams think right exactly um we all thought that the free agency that the Bruins had was a really good free agency. They made moves. Um, they did, they added some depth. I mean, they made a couple of good moves. Eric Halla, Olmark. I even consider no sec to be a good move, but you add guys like Derek Forbert, um, Nick Felino, and you know, it just really makes you think like, and don't get me wrong, Derek Forbert was fine because I saw him in, or Pylon, he, he was, uh, I saw him in the minors, um, in the LA Kings organization with the Manchester Monarchs. I saw him in the minor leagues and he was, um, at, I thought he was a good defenseman. 
I knew he was slow, but I thought he brought size. He did to that, um, to that team. But now he's just like standing around. He's like a taller, bigger version of Jeremy Lozon. <laughs> At least he doesn't put the puck in the skates. Yeah. He just- because yeah. my most iconic moment on stream happened in game two of that Islander series where he gave the puck away off coil skate, sent Sazikas on a breakaway and scored. And I went on this tangent. I posted it on my Instagram and I got a little flack for it. I'm not going to lie. I looked at the comments. I'm like, damn, people are not like, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was a very sad day. <laughs> that was, yeah, it, it was tough. That was a, that was a tough game because they had the game as well right like they had they had them pinned in the other zone and then all of a sudden this one play where it's just just give away and then goal and that's like everything the islanders are right it's a one one break kind of team all you get you give them a chance they're going to put it in every time so it's always the islanders it's always the damn islanders every single year yeah. thursday night they lose to the islanders and i go on this tangent last year they lost to the islanders i went on this tangent always the Islanders. I don't know. Maybe there's a new rivalry there. <laughs> I, hope not. I, I think I'm content with the Leafs right now. I, I think if Boston yeah. can keep beating the Leafs, I'll take it. But, um, <laughs> but yeah. I don't know. So if we were to go into a full-blown rebuild, like if Bruce Cassidy and Don Sweeney, the whole front office go, all right, it's clear this team isn't a playoff team. If we were to go into a full-blown rebuild, who is the first person you're moving? Me? Yep. First person I'd move. It, uh, well, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this. You know what? We're going to do it. Brad Marshawn. Wow. I'm even giving you flack right now. Because um, that is crazy that you'd even think about that. I think, I think first. Four first round picks. I will guarantee you, they trade Marshawn. They get at least four, probably more. And that rhymes. Poet and I didn't even know it. I think they need to focus on getting rid of guys who have requested trades first. Like Jake DeBrusque. He requested a trade months ago. It's February. Why hasn't Don Sweeney gotten a deal done? He, this was in December, right? Or November of December when he requested this. And now he's still here. <laughs> it's yeah it's sort of a joke I mean like the thing with Marshawn is that he in my opinion is the only one of the only players on this team that has value right now and if they are going into a rebuild he I think he's sort of like the corner piece right you're going to keep Mar- or Bergeron rather for the um for the leadership right you have him as your captain right now you can't really trade your captain um oh. and then you sort of look down the team I think Hall's here to stay Coyle Unfortunately, because of his contract, is here to stay. You have DeBrusque, Smith. Those guys are both uh, – everyone's here to stay. I think DeBrusque, if they do go into a rebuild, Marshawn takes his spot, and then he's happy. I think that's where – if they are going into a rebuild, that's where we go, right? Because he's been whining about top-line minutes, and he doesn't get his ice time and all this other stuff. But if they go into a rebuild, they're going to keep DeBrusque. He's young. He has talent. He has potential, which is why they aren't trading, by the way. that's It's a stupid thing where – they're not getting what they want because no team is going to start him on his first line. And that's, that's, that's the issue. So mm-hmm. I think if, if we are going like talking like full blow up, right? Like just complete team, no one's safe. I think Marshawn's the first to go. I don't see them trading Marshawn. Don't, don't, don't mistake me for that. Right. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But if they are, like, if I was, if I was told, I want you to blow up this team. I want to go into a full rebuild. Marshawn's going to be the first person I look at. Mm. And personally, I love Marshawn. I love him more than anything. But uh, he's the one who will bring the most value to your team. Do you, you, do you think you get a, a big return for Marshawn, who, like, in theory, has the most suspensions of any player in the history of hockey? This is an eighth one right now. He's still got two more games to serve. Uh, and I think, but he's got a lot of talent. Don't get me wrong, but is he, would he be considered like uh, a locker room per, uh, cancer per se? Like, I don't know. No, no. Like if you talk to anyone in that room, they all love Marshawn, right? Because yeah. it's one of those things where if he's on your team, you love him. If he's anywhere else, 
you absolutely despise the guy. But uh, at the end of the day, you're going to do just fine. Um, and I think they, they shouldn't hit the panic button yet. I think that they do need to definitely make some moves. Uh, but the panic button isn't there yet. They, they, they should keep away from it, right? Throw your phone off the cliff if you have to. Just don't uh, do anything stupid. But at the same time, you have to make a move eventually. DeBrusque, I think, is going to be the first one to go. Like if we're talking logistically, DeBrusque has to go, Seneshin has to go. Yep. Uh, I, I still know about Felino because it's sort of like Jeff Petrie, right? Where he has no value. He's on a bad contract. Um, so you kind of got to keep him around, but at the same time, he's not providing anything. So do you send him we down? Can do something? A waste of space, kind of. Exactly. Literally and figuratively. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to talk about Tuka Rask because he retired obviously and that's probably for the better for everybody um so now you're stuck with olmark and swayman who have both proved that they're elite goaltenders in this league swayman has really proved to me that he's a real an elite goaltender now so if you're um them do you think your spots are safe if you're going to full-on rebuild of this team do you think olmark or swayman are safe I think we are going to be in for quite the treat come trade deadline day. And I know I'm speaking riddles and I like to, I like to speak riddles, but I think that if we are talking the Bruins right now, they don't need two top end goalies. I think they need two good goalies. I don't think they need two elite goalies. And I think Allmark and Swayman are going to be what's going to come. So I think if they decide, okay, we're going to keep it simple. We're not going to blow this team up. They're going to keep Allmark. I think if they go into a rebuild, they're going to keep Swayman and trade Allmark. I think it's going to be one or the other uh, because right now it doesn't help anybody to be splitting time between a thirty, a top end thirty one year old. I'm not going to say he's not good. He's he plays hectic in his crease, but he kind of reminds me of, of uh, Tim Thomas a little bit in his yeah. attack butterfly, where he's just he's sporadic, right? He's everywhere in the crease versus a guy like Swayman, who's who very much reminds me of a, of a top end goaltender named Carey Price. Uh, just, just, just sort of the demeanor of him, the way he moves around. He reminds you of that sort of prime price. Um, and I think it is going to be very interesting to see what they decide to do because right now you have all this sort of room to go. Um, and I, I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, it's interesting, right? You have all these different options. And Sweeney, Sweeney knows all these options, right? I think it's, he's going to have to decide pretty quickly what they're going to do this year because they have an aging team. And unfortunately for them, uh, they're running out of time to make a deep push. I think if you look at this core, you think – if I'm, I'm looking at this Bruins roster right now, I have um, the roster open. I have cap friendly open. If you look at the team in on paper, this looks like a good team. But in reality, it's not. So, well, it's not – Great. If they can obviously bounce back, they just need to. What they need to do is start is start playing a full sixty minutes. Because I feel like I, I have, a lot of people have noticed this too. They do really good in the first period. That's their elite period. That's where they need to score. Second period, they're okay. They go into kind of like cruise control, and then the third period it just falls apart. And I and I don't know why that is. I think. They tonight against Ottawa, I think they need to like get the smelling salts out every period, wake these guys up, um, splash water in people's face. Like, I think this is what needs to happen. And Bruce Cassidy made this amazing comment earlier today in a press conference, and he said, um, We have a lot of nice guys on this team, however, we need to start playing like. That was an amazing line by Spike Cassidy, but here's the thing. He is absolutely right because this team is, is quite soft um, compared to other Bruins teams. They don't know how to win puck battles. They're not as physical as I want them to be. And to be honest, they're soft in the crease on either. Ooh, you're good. Um, they're soft in either crease of the, um, on either side of the, you know, other side of the, uh, of the ice near the net because defensively, We've seen this. Pucks come out in front all the time, and pucks are buried. There's no defense. And then in front of the net, there's like they're taking perimeter shots. Yeah. They're not taking close, good quality chances. And they're there when they are, but like they're not like every single, like not a lot throughout the game, you know? 
Yeah, I think they almost need like a wake up call, right? So, like, I don't, I don't know what's going to come of that wake up call because you even sort of look at it with what would that been? That would have been oh, last year uh, with the Taylor Hall, right? You sort of look at that. that. That got every single player on that team going, right? Because they knew that there was someone else that just got sent down that was coming for their spot, right? Even look at like a guy like, God bless him, but Nick Ritchie, right? Yeah, he, he got going as soon as Hall came came in, right? He got going because he had to get going because otherwise, to produce. yeah, because he had to play or else he wasn't going to play, right? Mm-hmm. Um, he like earned he, that he, third line spot, by the way. He earned that. Absolutely, he did. Yeah, and I, and I mean, even looking at him with the Leafs right now, he got sent down because he's not good. No offense to him. I'm just popping in here while editing, and I want to make this known. Uh, literally the day we filmed this, that night, Nick Ritchie got traded to Arizona from Toronto for Ilya Labushkin and Ryan Dezingle, who then went on tr- waivers, and then Dezingle went off to San Jose. Just a funny little note that happened. But when you look at who the Leafs have in their death chart, and I, I know I keep going back to the Leafs, but uh, you look at their death chart, mm. they have so many better players skill-wise that actually play with effort. And that's sort of where the Bruins struggled was because – they didn't have the effort, right? They had right. the skill to do it. They just didn't have the effort behind it. We look at a player like DeBrusque, who's pretty much a perfect representation of that. <laughs> uh, and it's sort of sad just to see him go like that. But He's got know? a lot of speed, a lot of skill. He has no finish. Exactly. People in my live chat always comment all the time, a lot of skill, no finish. They say they like to mock DeBrusque a lot, debust. 2015 like these we like and it all makes sense because we all know how bad that draft was Thank you know you got debrusque zaboral and who's the other one who is that Seneshin. other one in there Who was it Seneshin. Seneshin. oh yeah figures he wants to go and, as uh, well and then uh apparently i'm getting a snow squall right now from what i'm just being told apparently we're getting a snow we yeah, always well. a, a, a National Weather Service emergency ser- emergency alert. Snow squall warning. Slow down or s- delay travel. Be ready for a sudden drop to near zero visibility in icy roads and heavy snow. Oh, my God. We already got that today, so we're kind of lucky. But Good. Uh, <laughs> Good for y'all. Um, we're Good getting it you. right now, apparently. Um, yeah. But cool. uh, what I was saying was, so they let guys like – Matt Barzell, who's another guy I want to see the Bruins go after in the deadline because the Islanders are in a fire sale situation. The Islanders want – they I've seen they want to trade everybody. Cal Clutterbuck, uh, who was the other one? Palmieri, Bailey. Might as well get rid of Barzell too. And might as well bring him home to where he should have been in the first place, right? So Barzell, I want to see them – I want to – so that. You let, guy, you let a guy like Kyle Connor go to the Jets. Um, who was next? I think it was – oh, was it Sebastian Ajo? I don't know, something like that. One of the, I don't remember, but there was a couple of good players that got drafted after DeBrusque, Zaboral, and Seneshin. Yeah, it was, yeah I think so, it was. Maybe he went, oh no, I'm not sure. I think he might have I don't know, but there was a, it was Barzell and Connor, the main two, who yeah. you let go. And it was like, ba- it was back to back too, right? So that was the worst part. <laughs> yeah, we had, we had 13, 14, and 15 in that first round. Ugh. Which would have made us go into, terrible cap issues right but at the end of the day i i'd I'd prefer cap issues to the three jokes of a well no two jokes in zaboral because before he got hurt zaboral was playing actually really good because like and then unfortunately he tore his acl which hurt because zaboral was actually playing top line d minutes with mcavoy and he was actually that was a good duo yeah fortunately didn't pan out he's done the rest of the year as well right i'm pretty sure yeah he's done for the year yeah and then Seneshin, he says he wants NHL time. He's not he, – he, no. The thing is with Seneshin is I saw a little bit of him in Providence. I've seen him a little bit in the preseason. He's nothing to write home about. And, and I don't want to be disrespectful, but, like, he's not – he's not even good as Jake DeBrusque. No. By a long shot. And, and I, think it's, I think it might be around the time now where we, we bring back a Bruins legend, Chris Wagner. He's still under contract. Wait a minute. He is still under contract. I didn't realize this. He's two, in the, two more years. Two years he's in the left. He's buried penalty right now. Oh, yep. 
I think it's time to bring to bring back the goat himself. You know, Wags. You know, the, the mayor of Walpole. We need to get him back up here. Um, I think we need to consider, like, why is Nick Felino playing instead of Oscar Steen? Why is he in Providence? Because he's proven and he's earned that third line NHL uh, right wing NHL spot. But now he's sitting in Providence, you know, dilly dallying and you know, waiting for the call. But and I also think another person to think about for the future is Jack Stanika, because he's another one who I think could be a good, a big star in this league, who could be, who could be technically Bergeron's replacement. I think Stanika has the ability to. Um, I just think I think he just needs to showcase it more. And another guy who I'm actually really excited for is the guy we drafted this past year. I cannot wait to see Fabian Lasalle in this league because mm-hmm. I feel like because he's playing in the WHL in Vancouver right now. He's having an amazing year, and apparently after this playoff run, he's going to go to Providence, and there's a possibility that he could be on this team next year. So at 19, being in the NHL, and if he proves that he can do it, I don't know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he's been tearing it up as well in, in the, with Vancouver, right? So He's having an incredible I mean, season. He's got like – I'll pull up his numbers right now, so I'll read them off to you so you can see what they are because they are insane. Yeah. Uh, with the Vancouver Giants, he's got in 31 games played, 15 goals, 20 assists for 35 points. Half this team couldn't say they got 35 points right now. So the fact that he's doing this in the WHL at 19, he's going to be 20 next year. He's going to be 20 in January. Why isn't – he being considered to possibly even hell have a, if we make the playoffs, maybe consider him being here. Like it's a weird thing to think about, but it's a good conversation to have, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, it's one of those things where Sweeney has a lot on his plate right now. Mm-hmm. He's got to figure out like, like his first thing is what are you, what are you doing? Right. Are you, are you trying to be a middle line team or are you trying to be a top end contender? Or are you trying to be rebuild up? right now? They're stuck in the middle. He hasn't shown that he wants to go either way. And I think it's going to be apparent quickly, the closer we get to the deadline, whether or not which side he's leaning. Because he's either going to lean one way or he's going to lean the other. Or he's going to do absolutely nothing. And we've seen him do that. I mean, he's not the brightest. <laughs> I'm sure you can attest to that. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, like if he sticks down the middle this year and he doesn't do anything, oh. yeah, they're going to look like the big- biggest genius in this world or is going to be the biggest doofus. And there's no middle line because they're either going to win the cup or they're going to do nothing and they're going to miss the, they miss the playoffs. I'm going to kill them. If they uh, miss the playoffs, I'm going to, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose my mind. But, but like, like for me, if, if they uh, rebuild okay. and miss the playoffs, whatever, we, we see progress. Right. If we, if, if we don't do anything and we miss the playoffs, that's my issue. And I think, Whatever he decides to do, he's going to have some flack for. Yep. But at the end of the, end of the day, he's got to do something, right? So. He has to do something. He has to. Because I feel like there are some upgrades. And I think the snow squall stopped. Um, I think he needs to do something because the upgrades are, are apparent that we need. He needs a better defenseman. You need a second line center that's actually consistent second line center. Hall is great. He's been playing fine with Hall and Pasternak. He's shown that he's worth the contract he has right now. That's apparent. Hall will be here for the remainder of his contract. I think he's safe. However, you want somebody who is has more value than Halla. You know? Yeah. That's sure. why I, I again bring up Barzell, Garland, um, JT Miller. Um, I'd even consider a Claude Giroux if that contract wasn't so damn expensive. Any of those four guys I consider maybe bringing in. Um, and for defensemen, it's apparent that the defense is not great at all because you've got McAvoy, Grizzly, like I'd even throw in the conversation, Vakanainen, and then everybody else. Because you got Brandon Carlo, who is making $4.1 million the next six seasons in starting this year, which is something else in itself. You've got Derek Forbert or Pylon bag of bricks, 3 million for the next three years. Riley's got the same contract and there's obviously a difference. Riley is miles better than Forbert right now. And then 
Con- Connor Clifton is making a million over the next two seasons starting this year. And he's proven to me that he is not an NHL worthy defenseman in my personal opinion. Yeah, for sure. So I think Clifton, if you're going to trade defensemen to get better defensemen, Clifton has to go and forward have to go. Everybody yeah. else I think is safe for now. Cause Carlo, that contract, nobody will take. No, no. Rizlik, I think he'll, I think he'll develop. I think, I think his potential is still there. Um, I think he just needs more time to develop there. Riley, I think is safe and Bakanine and I think is safe. I, I, I would be surprised if they trade back and on him. I think yep. if they do decide to do that, it's because they need bigger defensemen, right? Like back and I, and you look at the majority of their defensive prospects and they're all like five foot seven, five foot eight. They're all relatively short for like top end defensemen. Uh, and even Grizzly, like the, it, all their like high end prospects, they don't have anybody who's like a big, big guy like Tyler Sagan or, uh, looking back in years past, right? We're, we have that sort of like massive size advantage. Uh, Char, Seidenberg, McQuaid, Boychuk, McQu- um, Kevin Miller, you know, uh, even Miller. Tomas Caverle, Wade Redden. You had those guys. Remember Wade Redden? Um, that, that's a trivia question. That's an answer to a trivia question. Um, but you had size. And now you've got your biggest guy on that team is – Bag of bricks and Carlo. And Carlo. <laughs> and Carlo. On top, so, Pylon, sorry, on top of that, there's Carlo. Um, Pylon and Carlo. Those are the two guys I always want to be my defenders. Yeah. Just but, yeah. stand around and do nothing, I guess. Well, that's what Fleeno um, is there for as well, right? It was just to be that big presence on the team, but. Hasn't really shown it. Most, yeah, he hasn't done anything, but. So here's my question to you. So I'm looking at the Providence roster. John Moore's in Providence right now. Would you rather see him play than Derek Forbert? Don't do this to me. No, absolutely not. Really? I think Derek – so this is where I get into my own little thing. But okay. for me, I think Derek Forbert's better than John Moore is. And as much as I would like to see Forbert get a little spark, and I think that's might be what they end up doing, right? Because, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, at the end of the day, you have – forward who isn't playing great right now you even look at with smith right when they sat smith for the one game craig smith the next like week or so he went off he scored like i don't remember was it like five like pretty much all of his goals to this point um was just off that sort of one week after he got sat and then he cooled off whatever uh he, he's not there to be a t- like the top but he's still playing decent on that top line right now he's still playing the, right. smith smith is a first line right now i think he's fine for now yeah, um, but like, at, like if you think about it back to it, right, he wasn't even being a good third-line player at that point. But as soon as they sat him and put, I don't know who it was, I think it was one of the younger guys, might have been Steen for that matter, yep. he got going because he knew that his spot was at risk, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the whole thing is once you see you're in trouble, you got to start playing. And I think if they do the same thing with the defenseman, you bring in a top-end guy who then pushes everybody else out, everyone's going to start playing for their role. Same thing with the forwards. You see one of the forwards come in, everyone's going to start playing for their roles because they, at the end of the day, they want to play. Mm-hmm. Um, so whether or not you're playing, whether at the end of the day you're not, I think you want to be the one out on the ice playing for yep. your team. And uh, if you see yourself not being there, I think you might be in trouble. And I mean, that's sort of the end goal. And I do apologize because this sun is brutal right now. Uh, <laughs> and it is just wreaking havoc on my face. So I do apologize for that. But uh, yeah. That's fine. Um, so I think, I think what Forbert needs is there's, there's one thing that I can think of that Forbert needs. Give more a spot for a night, G- give him the Smith treatment, let more play for one night to bring him up, have Forbert sit in the press, press box and watch more play. Say, okay, why am I not there? Why am I not the one on the ice? And then that'll get him going in his head. And then maybe He's not the fastest, but maybe he'll start using his size to his advantage. Maybe he'll start getting pucks out you know, of, the, of your own zone and, you know, being a bigger presence like he should be. He's the tallest defenseman the Bruins got, or probably tied with Carlo, I think. But yeah, for sure. I think that should be a, um, 
a shot in the a shot in the arm, uh, any term you could use, a wake up call. So well, even the guy like you know a Sean who's still down there, he's younger. Sean, we've we've seen that he can play. Yeah. Same with a guy like Tyler Lewington. That's another one we've seen who we've seen that he can. He's he's an, he's NHL worthy. I think. Exactly. So do you put them in the lineup tonight? Or not tonight, obviously, because we already have our lineup maybe set. Maybe Monday against Colorado. Maybe you put them in instead of Forward and Clifton and see how they play together, and maybe that's a, a wake-up call to them. Well, the other thing is, and this is where it gets fun, is if they play really well, do you send them back down or do you keep them and then you trade your other two nonchalant guys, mm-hmm. right? That's and a good question. <laughs> right? This is what I like about – and even look at with um, – uh, Swayman and Bladar last year, right? They got oh, a chance yeah. to play. They didn't waste that opportunity. They and because of that, Halak was the third, fourth string goalie at that point. Mm-hmm. That's why it was Rask and Swayman in the playoffs. Exactly. Bladar was in Providence, bringing Providence a uh, a division championship. They won the Atlantic Division, the minors, and then now he's playing God mode with Calgary right now in the in the Flame system. I don't know if he's in the AHL. I don't know if he's – I'm not – I don't follow Calgary too much. He's back in the NHL, and he's still dominating because yeah, he's as soon still, as he's away, he shut out the Leafs in his first start with Calgary. I'm like, <laughs> Leafs slander again. Um, but – The best you know, Any chance I get to, to crap on the Leafs, I can. Um, for Leafs fans watching this, 1967. Anyway, um, back to that. Uh, so, you know, you had guys like Vladar. You had guys like uh, Swayman who were better than Halak was. Um, and now he's stuck in Vancouver. He can't get out. He won't waive his no-move clause. Vancouver wants it to trade him. It's, it's a mess. But, you know, you had Swayman and Vladar who were proving you were better. Vladar had that amazing start against Pittsburgh last year, which kind of sent him off into his shot into the, you know, into the northwest part of Canada. And then... <laughs> You know, now he now it's he's doing good there. Swayman and Olmark are doing fine here, so you, you got to think about that. And then the minors right now for goaltenders, you're not you're not, you're not uh, doing too bad. Troy Grosnick, Kyle Kieser, Callum Booth, you've got some decent goalies in the minors right now. So who knows, man? This this could be a weird next few years, you know. Sorry, I'm still just trying to figure out this lighting thing. This is this is not. <laughs> there we go. I think that's better. Here we go. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I know the goalies are solid. I mean, like Grosnick, yeah, he's thirty-two, but I mean, he's still not terrible for what? What like the fourth, third string goaltender for Boston? You even consider Rask into that, right? Mm-hmm. He, he's a solid AHL goaltender who has the potential, especially with Callum Booth behind him. You have goalies in case one of the two get hurt, or you don't have to play them, right? You look at Tampa who. Just brought in Brian Elliott to be their backup, and that's a starting goaltender for most teams. Um, mm-hmm. So it's this whole idea that you need two goaltenders, but at the end of the day, I don't know if you do. Well, you want to give your top goalie rest in theory. Oh. So you don't want. So like I think they ran into this in the middle years where the Bruins were bad. They had Rask, and then they brought. And then they had guys like Malcolm Subban, who were, who was bad at the time. Uh, who else did they have? They had John, uh, no, uh, what was his name? Oh my, God. Jonas Gustafsson. Uh, these random goaltenders, all right? And now you've got a solidified pair in Olmark and Swayman, who I do not think they will split up. I think they'll keep them. And I, I think it might be a playoff tandem even. They might, if they make the playoffs, they might switch off, I think, because both of them are elite top level goaltenders and you want that. You don't, like Rask and Halak for a couple years there, that was a one-two punch. Olmark and Swayman, I think we got the same thing going on. It's a one-two punch for them too. Yeah, for sure. And just sort of touch on that, right? You have the two goaltenders. Like I get that idea, but at the same time, do you need two elite goaltenders? That's sort of the question. Do you need two go- two elite goaltenders, or do you need say you can pick up? I don't know what kind of goalies are on the market right now, but. Um, sort of that like backup role you can trade with camp like keep trading with top end teams in the division at that but would you tr- make a like a bottom end deal for a guy like Brian Elliott and you have you can pick your poison with Swayman or Allmark trading one of them away for a top defense or forward which you desperately need and like even with the Oilers right you look at the Oilers right now they're in a colossal dump when oh. it comes to ending. 
Um, so do you make a deal with them? Maybe pick up Tool the RV? Do you pick up Hyman? I hope not for Hyman, but. Um, Tyler Yamamoto? Exactly. Like, like you, you have all of these kind of guys you can mm. potentially make a trade for. Um, but I don't know if it's if it's worth it at the end of the day. But who knows? I feel like I feel like they're good for with Allmark and Swayman for right now. I think I think they're okay. I don't think they're gonna worry about moving moving them right now. Sweeney always finds a way to impress. So that, that, that's my favorite thing to say because it's just true. You you think he's gonna do something he doesn't. You don't think he's gonna do anything he does stuff. So I said I mean, it last year. I was like, oh no, nah, he's not gonna do anything. This team's he's think, he's gonna think this team's fine. Goes ahead and gets Taylor Hall. Yeah, that, that that's you know. <laughs> yeah, and and for some reason, I remember I remember the I think it was eleven fifty five that Friedman reported it because sure enough, I was still awake, mm -hmm. and it was right after Washington blew them out like seven seven one eight one nine yeah, one. I remember I uh, was not streaming that game surprisingly. I don't <laughs> know why, um, and then I was like. I have a feeling after looking at this score that something's going to happen tonight. Yeah. And then I hear rumblings that the Bruins are, are interested in Taylor Hall. I'm like, okay, well, that, that means nothing. And then I'm like, the Bruins are closing in on Taylor Hall. I'm like, oh, God. Oh, here it comes. And then here's the big deal. And then I'm like, great, we got Taylor Hall. And I was like, oh, we traded Anders Bjork back to Buffalo for him. Which – And we got Lazar. I won't mind if we got – in my, I, I love Lazar's play style. So, in my opinion, we actually won. Oh twice. yeah, we got Lazar in that deal too. Like for me, and this oh, is yeah. this is a bold opinion for me though. I prefer Lazar over Bjork. Oh, me too, because Lazar uh, actually can produce. He's got seven goals this year. He's actually producing some decent scoring, uh, decent stats. I'll pull up the stats right now. Lazar's got. Uh, let's see. Come on, pull him up. He's got, I'm oh, sorry, he's got six goals, six assists for 12 points in 41 games. He has a plus two plus minus rating right now. Um, you know, he played with, he scored against the Senators last week. So he's, he's, and he's also, he's physical. Same with Bleed. It's another one. That Those two are very, are little pests on the ice, I swear. Like, Bleed's been getting into it the past few games with these tall guys. Like, Bleed was shoving Chara the other night. I'm like, why? You're going to get killed. But, um, you know. They just don't care. They, they, they're playing for their, their lives, right? Like, like that's spot. what I like about the fourth, the third line guys on, on any team. You look pretty much across the board, they're going to give you the most effort they have. Mm -hmm. First line guys, not as much. Second line guys, sort of on that cusp. But third and fourth line guys every night are not safe. Your first line guys are always going to be protected. You've got even guys like Hall, Pasternak, Marshawn, and Bergeron, right? Those yep. four guys don't have to give, like, they're going to give 100% most nights, not saying every night, but if they, if they take an off night, say they get 50%, they're not getting, they're not getting sat for the next four weeks. No, because right? that would be a detrimental thing to your team, you know? Exactly. But if you take a look at a fourth line or third line guy, they give 50% effort, mm -hmm. minus Debraska's, Debraska's in his own loop. Um, you're getting benched for the next month, two months. Bleed. Right? Bleed's very in and out. Like, yeah. I feel, because Bleed apparently isn't playing tonight. Apparently, you're still trying to figure out the lighting, I see. Um, I, so, I, I don't know. There you go. so, like, apparently the third line is Stanika Holofolino. That's yeah. apparently what the third line is tonight, and then it's going to be no sect of Russ Lazar yeah, against it's Ottawa, cool. from, what, from what I understand. And I'm just like, uh, why? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You I mean, know? Yeah, it's one of those things where. I, mean, I feel like I just contradicted my own statement. I said, oh, well, Stadiga deserves more time, and then Bleed sets. I'm like, oh, why? But, like, <laughs> but I don't know. I feel like they could have worked out differently. I feel like Felino needs to sit. Make him wake up. That's another one. Shot in the arm. Watch somebody else, you know, play and say, okay, well, I need to wake up, you know? Well, especially for a veteran guy too, right? Because, mm -hmm. like, in theory, you look at his contract right now, he's got two years left, right? Just on his contract alone. And then you look at what's he going to do after? Do you treat him like a Spezza, right? Where, I don't know if you, once again, I know I keep going on the Leafs, but. It's oh, God, back to the Leafs. I swear, you're from Canada. It's bound to happen, but. 
<laughs> uh, well, it's the only team anybody ever talks about up here, so you, you get enough of an earshot. But in my opinion, yeah. Jason Spezza is the best fourth line player you will find on any team. Because one, he gives 100% every night. Two, he scores goal like up the wazoo. And I mean, just it, he, he, he comes to play every night. And at the end of the day, that's what you need from a fourth line guy. Mm. And when you score goals, that's how you make it into the lineup. Right. So I, I, don't, I don't know. Like, even if you make a deal for him, I think the, like, he's, he doesn't want to move because he wants to be in his hometown, whatever. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think you have the possibility there um, to really start to reshape the fourth line, the third line, and maybe even give a little shot to the uh, second line guys. Maybe you bench one of them, get the entire team kick started, right? Which is what, of course, Felino was supposed to be. Exactly. Uh, until that happened. but This season has been awful for him. He's only got a goal under his belt. He should have been a second, but that's not here, there, here nor there. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I don't know. <sighs> Spezza, that would be a good, a good little team player to have there. Yeah, but he, he, he won't move because he, he only wants to play in his hometown. So, mm. it's just Toronto as a whole, but – um, but yeah, so uh, it's just another player you add to the list of players that you want but can't have, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, I feel like what sent this team down into where they are now was years ago when they trade when Shirelli decided to make a stupid move and trade Sagan to Dallas. I think that was the worst decision they could have made. Well, you see, it was until you look at what what it could have been, right? Because in terms of Sagan, I mean, what are you going to do with them right now? Because Boston has, what, a million and a half in cap space? You're going to afford a $10 million, $11 million player? Well, that could be uh, different, depending on, like, where we could be now if Sagan was still here. Well, yeah. we also don't have Louis Erickson, put it that way. <laughs> that guy was a, was a character. I don't want Louis Erickson, period. I'm, I was furious when I saw that trade. I was like, no. Louie Erickson, Riley Smith, who is that guy? Now I know Riley Smith is the top right wing on the Knights right now. It, it's weird though because any pl- it's mm. every player that go either leaves Boston all of a sudden comes into this top end guy, and it's really annoying too. I can um, probably name five off the top of my head right now. Well, even the goaltenders like Vladar, <laughs> fourth string goaltender on any other team on, on pretty much every team goes up to the north in Calgary and all of a sudden just goes on a, a tangent and starts to win. Like, I mean, it's one of those things where it's just nuts, but oh well. Yeah. There's just too many, too many scenarios there for that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm just looking at this, I'm looking at contracts right now and I'm literally vomiting in my mouth. <laughs> I mean, why is DeBrus making th- almost four million dollars this year? That's my real concern. I mean, the worst part was that was that was a good deal at the time too, eh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because this contract was uh, signed back, you know, last year. And I was like, oh yeah, DeBrus, that's fine. You know, oh yeah, that's a great deal. deal. It's gonna be a team-friendly contract. We'll be fine. Yeah. Last year, not the worst player on the ice, definitely not the best. And then this year, he's been pathetic well, yeah. that. well, well yeah. he was really good in the playoffs too right DeBrusque I mean every Those Toronto- couple of years there when the yeah against the Leafs in the first round he was the he's, he's that's why people call him the Leaf killer I can count him out on all three on all the fingers here um yeah. but like yeah it was just between him like in the against Boston was always Kapanen who's now on Pittsburgh and is really good like any Leaf player, once they leave, they get really good. Uh, same here. Like Kessel and it's like the same thing as Boston, except it's just Boston typically gets the Leafs players and then turns them into really good Rask and then Kessel and all these other guys. But uh, what can you do, right? Just yeah. Another story. Oh, here's, oh, that's another player we could get, eh? Kessel. Maybe. I mean, I'm curious to see what Phil Kessel would be like in a Bruins uniform now. Because, like, because 
back when he was with the Bruins, right, before I even really knew what was going on in hockey, I mean, I still was a fan of them. I still really didn't understand. I was like, wow, this guy's really good, you know? Because he, well, he, he was in shape back then. He was not um, as uh, 2BC Productions would say, uh, fat still Kessel. That's not, that's not what he said. Um, that's not what he was then. He is, you know, he's now a, he, he was then a, you know, a very good, you know, elite top three level player who is playing with Patrice Bergeron on the top line with, you know, uh, who was on that left side? Was it Lucic? No. Maybe it was Vladimir Saboka. Uh... Vladimir Saboka. That's who it was. <laughs> it was Saboka or, or Marco Sturm, one of the two. Yeah, he's playing Sabotka. He's, he's out in, uh, where is he right now? He's, he's in Russia playing, right he's now? He's playing in the Olympics. No, he's playing out in the Olympics with the Czechs. They just oh. got knocked out. Um, yeah, yeah. He, he just, uh, it, it was one of those names, right, where you come across it and it's like, I know that name. Let's do a little bit of research. Sure enough, uh, yeah, he, he played with Boston for a number of years. Yeah, I remember. Same with uh, another one that I still, I still hate this trade to this day, Marco Sturm, right? Mm. Because at the time, I was like, why are we trading him? Yeah. And what were those considerations that he was traded for to L.A.? To this day, I still don't know. Because we then, a few years later, traded Lucic to L.A. Like, <laughs> like why? What, what were those considerations? I don't know. Was it yeah. money? Was it just because we wanted to get rid of him? Which makes zero sense. For... And like, yeah, there's just, like, some classic Bruins names from, like, the past, like, 10 years that you think, like, wow, he was a Bruin. Like, Sturm, Sabuka, Kessel, Miroslav Shatan. Remember him? <laughs> You know, uh, uh, what was the, like just some great like players on this team, and then you're just like, like, where do they go? Like, yeah, it's just it's like, where are they now? Like, it's it's you know. Oh well, what can you do, right? Just another story in the Bruin saga of bad trades and uh, yeah, even better players. Man, you you just look at this team, and you just like this current core, and you're just like, how? Like, on paper, this team looks amazing. Yeah, exactly. And then they're just like, nope, they're not great. No, for sure. I'm, watch- I'm going to be watching this Bruins Ottawa game in about two hours from now, and I'm probably going to be dreading it. I'm just going to be like. <laughs> well, I'll make you a deal. And this is my prediction, is that if they lose tonight, and I have a feeling something's coming here that we aren't going to like, there's going to be a big trade tonight. And I want to make sure this is put down in the register. February 19th, uh-huh. big trade coming down tonight if Boston loses. I'll give you this. It might not be tonight, but by Monday afternoon when the Bruins play Colorado, there will be a, there, uh, there will be a shakeup. Colorado, oh boy, that's it. Of some sort, whether it's a firing of a coach or a general manager, or it could be some sh- ground sh- earth-shaking move, maybe, you know, coil like or maybe the Bruins do something yeah. something changes by Monday yeah something ambitious happened it's called the team turned it around beat Ottawa Saturday night and then beat Colorado five to one last Monday <laughs> yeah something did change all right wasn't a coast coach or a roster switch up it was a it was a uh, a flip switch on the entire team just flipped it around and the Bruins started playing really really good so something changed I just wanted to see them make progress, progress towards their goal. Once again, I don't care if it's a rebuild. If they, if they blow the team up, whatever, right? It's an unfortunate part of hockey where you're, it's going to happen. So whether that's in two years, three years, four years, or right now, doesn't really matter. I just don't want them to go down blinded straight down the middle and just be content with losing in the first round just because we can say we made the playoffs, so be it, right? Yeah which is what St. Louis was as well back in 2019. But I mean, and they actually went on to win the whole cup and then they haven't, excuse me, they haven't gotten out of the first round since they, well, lost, exactly. That's... they lost to the Canucks in the COVID bubble. And then they lost to the abs last year. Yeah. So, and I have a feeling they might be in the same fire sale as Boston might be in and the Islanders for that matter too. Right. Oh yeah. The blues are definitely going to, I think they're going to be selling. I don't think Tara Sanko will be a blue at the end of this. I don't think, uh, Jordan Bennington might not be a blue by the end of this. And I don't think Tory Krug, I think I have a weird feeling 
that Don Sweeney is going to go into the bag and go get Krug. I, I, I hope so. I hope, they give, <laughs> like, I hope they give like a third round pick and like a prospect or something, just something really small and useless. Get um, rid of, get rid of Forbert and Clifton and go get Krug. Perfect. <laughs> like, Clifton's Krug's replacement anyway. So yeah, Forbert, <laughs> Clifton, and maybe hell throw in Seneshin in there, get, and get Krug in a pick back. I think that's a fair deal. Exactly. So and the reason we bring that up is because if you look at the Blues cap friendly, which I'll put a graphic up, if you scroll down, their roster, their contracts are terrible. You, that, that is a non-team friendly contract up and down. Tarasenko, O'Reilly, Saad, per, uh, Pareko, Bennington, you, you name it. Falk, Crew, keep all going on and on and on. You don't have those guys. Uh, well, you are, but you're paying them a crap ton of money, so you're gonna have to move a couple pieces in order to get underneath the cap. So when you go to to free agency, you can actually go get some new pieces. Because if you look at this team now, they're in a good spot in the playoffs, but they have a, too many guys making four or five million a season, if not more. So it's just the way of hockey. It's unfortunate because the Blues have a good team, just they can't they can't afford anything right now. I think that's it. I think we've pretty much addressed every need and every situation the Bruins need to get themselves into the playoffs are in two months the deadline is just over a month away it's going to be on March 21st and it sucks because I'm going to have school that day so I'm not going to be able to follow anything until after it happens uh so I, I, I call for a national skip day what do, you, what do you say I mean they should make this the day after the Super Bowl a national holiday um <laughs> so everybody can sleep so they can keep it on Sunday nights but that's – I feel like it should be, you know, like national hockey fans skip school day or skip work day to follow the well, trip. Well, well, the thing about Canada is that everyone's a hockey fan. So as much Especially as – Especially in Canada, exactly. The U.S., not much so much. As, Maybe Canada. As much as it's not a skip day, it's a skip day. Everyone's, everyone's in school, and, it's, and there's, there's always no tests on that day, and there's always no projects, no presentations, no nothing. The exactly. teachers put the put the the live feed on the board, and Good. everyone just did their work. I was it, doing that last year because I was still I was going into school last year when the deadline was going on. Yeah, I was in school and I was like, oh well, there goes break. No, this was last year when the free agency was going on. Twenty twenty yeah. free agency. I was like, oh, there goes Brayden Holpe. He's going to Dallas. So, <laughs> oh, uh, or Vancouver at the time, right? Yeah. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, but another – speaking of goaltenders, um, I don't know if you heard about this. Jamie McLennan at TSN with the stupidest report I've ever heard that the Bruins could be a dark horse for Marc-Andre Fleury, which, again, boggles my mind. But knowing Don Sweeney, he might do something stupid like that. As I like to say, whenever someone starts with Jamie McLennan, what's new? <laughs> Exactly. Guy, I've always known that. I've always felt like he's like he doesn't know what he's talking about. Like he shouldn't be a hockey analyst, in my opinion. Like if, if, does, Elliot, yeah. if Elliot Friedman or Pierre LeBrun, even like a Bob McKenzie or, or Frank Ciervelli would say something like that, I'd be like, okay, there might be some something to it. Anybody else, even Darren Drager, I'd throw in there. Anybody else, I'm like, no, no way. No, you know? McClendon has no sources. He he he's trying to be nice here because I do watch them and because that's all that's ever on, right? You get the Canadian networks, it's TSN and Sportsnet. Um, but you look at them and they're, they're, they make such controversial opinions and predictions and all this other stuff with yep. no backing. Like it's it just bad. Um, and at the end of the day, whatever. Yeah, that's why they're there and we're not. But I mean. Exactly. I, mean, I always I always am watching the TSN's feed to the deadline every year. Yeah. You know, I, I like it's usually on ESPN or NHL network here in the States. But I had I had this streaming service that I think I still have it where I get Canadian channels. Yeah. It's like I sometimes can watch it straight off TSN, but I don't know. Well, anyway, um, this team needs to change and I need to change about right now is what we're going to say. Something needs to change. Um, well, I think that's going to be it for us here. Um, so uh, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I'm going to cut it down probably to the things we probably need to address the most. I think I'll cut this down a little bit. 
Um, if you have not yet, make sure to drop a big like on this video if you liked it. Subscribe if you really liked the video. Um, make sure to hit that bell, get notified every single time I upload a new video. Uh, definitely go subscribe to Parker on YouTube on the fly. The link is down below in the description. Uh, definitely go uh, click the link and go um, watch his stuff. He is, uh, he probably knows a hell of a lot more of hockey, more about like hockey and like the, like, the, like this stuff that we just talked about more than I do. Um, so definitely go watch him. Um, make sure to follow me on Instagram and TikTok. Links down below in the description. Go follow him on Instagram as well. On the fly. Uh, 15, one, 15, 15. 1515 on Instagram. Uh, make sure to go follow him there. And uh, it's been a pleasure uh, yep, talking to you. We'll have to do these more often, I think. For sure. Yeah. Um, and how about this? Well, on the, on the biggest next trade for Boston, because that might be in eight years time. Let's, let's be honest here. We're not <laughs> yeah. um, we'll, we'll have you out for a video. How about that? So uh -huh. yeah, for make sure. sure to hit subscribe Sam's channel, my channel. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Go do that. And uh, he doesn't just do Bruins. He does everything. He's been doing the Olympics. He's been doing recaps on every single Olympic team uh, underneath the, underneath God's hot sun. So definitely uh, go consider, go subscribing to him. He's definitely does some great content over there. And with that being said, thank you guys so much for watching this video. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out.